Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Lewin, the CEO of the Computer History Museum. I hope everyone is well and safe. Well, with the pandemic, our doors in Mountain View are closed, but our digital doors are wide open. So I'm pleased to welcome you to today's virtual event. With only 28 days until the election, our distinguished panel will focus on the US technology policy issues critical for this election and the next presidential administration as well as Congress. Our programs are made possible through the generosity of our members and donors, including so many of you as our core donors and many members of our Lifetime Giving Society. We appreciate your strong support of the museum and today we need your support more than ever to sustain the operations and deliver on our mission, which is to decode technology for everyone. It's computing past, digital present, and the future impact on humanity. Here to introduce today's program and speakers is Marguerite Gong Hancock, the museum's VP of Innovation. Welcome, Marguerite. Thank you so much, Daniel, and I'm delighted to add my warm welcome to each of you. Last week, during the first presidential debate for election 2020, the two candidates expressed dramatically different views towards science and its role in government policy. This election comes at a critical juncture for the United States for science, technology, and policy and the relationship between the public and private sectors. Continuing our fall programming series on election 2020 and technology, today's program will explore critical issues for policy implications for us as digital citizens. Past experience tells us this matters deeply for our national security, economy, society, and day-to-day -day lives. Take, for example, a presidential decision that was triggered some 63 years ago this month. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first space satellite, a development that shocked and dismayed American leaders. Lyndon Johnson, then Democratic Senate leader, agonized, quote, soon they'll be dropping bombs on us from space, like kids dropping rocks onto cars from freeway overpasses. Determined to ensure the country's technology innovation power, President Eisenhower established the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, with a more than $500 million budget. Over its storied history, ARPA, later known as DARPA, has impacted military missile defense and stealth technology, as well as uh, fields from lasers to GPS and much more. ARPANET was foundational for the internet. ARPA research in artificial intelligence and speech recognition and signal processing, such as shaking a robot in our CHM collection, paved the way for autonomous navigation. While the impact of government on technology and technology in our lives has been clear, critical questions continue to be hotly debated. What are effective roles and actions for public and private sectors in the US for technology innovation? How can we understand the critical domestic technology uh, issues and options for those leading the US following election 2020? What tech policies make sense today for the US in the global arena? And how can policies for tech serve the public good? For today's program, we're thrilled to convene a distinguished panel of experts from Silicon Valley to Washington, D.C. to London and beyond to help decode today's critical technology policy issues for us as digital citizens. As is tradition, I'll introduce our speakers using five numbers. Judy Estrin, Silicon Valley technologist, executive, serial entrepreneur, and CEO, J-Labs. 21, her age as a Stanford graduate student when she worked on the team developing TCP, one of the main protocols for the internet eight companies co-founded, six corporate boards served, including Disney and FedEx, 2008, the year her book Closing the Innovation Gap was published, 30 years in her most important role as mother to son David. Ro Khanna, congressman, former lecturer in economics at Stanford and in law at Santa Clara University, and former deputy assistant secretary of the Department of Commerce. 17, the California congressional district he represents, which includes Silicon Valley, 1976, the bicentennial here was born, 777,468 constituents in his district, five bills in his name that have passed the House, two terms served in Congress so far. Congressman, thank you for participating today for the first segment of the program. We, re we recognize you need to uh, leave uh, partway through the program for another commitment. Mariana Mazzucato, professor in the economics of innovation and public value at the University of College London, where she's founding director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She's author of The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking uh, Public Versus Private Sector Myths, and The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy. 
1968, the year she was born during the summer of revolution, 136,600 followers on Twitter, four, the number of children she has, 2030, the year we need to reach the UN Sustainable Development Goals, three, prime ministers she is directly advising. Anne-Marie Slaughter, CEO of New America, Professor Emerit at Princeton, former Dean of Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, and former Director of Policy Planning for the US Department of State. 23 years, she was a professor. Two years, she worked in the department, State Department as Director of Policy Planning. Eight books she's written or co-edited. 30 times she's been featured on Fareed Zakaria's weekly public affairs show. 150 birds on her life list. Margaret Amara. Our moderator for this program is Margaret Amara. Margaret brings her expertise as a historian focused on the history of US politics, the growth of Silicon Valley and the tech economy, and the connections between the two. Prior to her academic career, she worked in the Clinton White House and served as a contributing researcher at the Brookings Institution. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to CHM Live, Margaret. One more note, here at CHM, we're pleased to convene today's superb panelists who bring a remarkable combination of expertise and ex experience. I wanted to just underscore that with one small indicator. Each has published a noteworthy book I'd like to recommend uh, that are relevant for today's topic at the intersection in an intersection of government and technology policy innovation and implications for a shaping better future. And not just one, the tally of total books published by our five speakers today is 15. Judy, Roe, Mariana, and Marie, welcome to CHM Live. Margaret, thank you so much for leading today's important and timely conversation. Thank you so much, Marguerite. It's a real joy to be here, and I am so thrilled to motivate this truly our all-star panel. I can't imagine four people better suited to have this conversation about technology and innovation policy, which is more than just includes legislation and lawmaking, the business that the congressman is in, but also these broader questions um, that affect both public and private sectors and the questions of how the two intersect. So without further ado, I wanted to open it up um, by, uh, open the conversation up by asking each of you in turn to, to speak about some of the salient issues on, on the plate today as we are less than a month from the presidential election of 2020. And we have a lot of technology policy issues that are very live in Washington. Um, so, Ro, Congressman, I wanted to turn to you first and ask, what, and from where you sit, what do you think are the most important ish, policy issues right now um, that are facing the next U.S. President and the Congress, as well as the courts? Give us the lay of the land. Well, thank you, Margaret. What a uh, distinguished panel. I'm honored to be on it and, and know some of the uh, participants well who have been uh, great voices and whose counsel has helped uh, me. I would say there are a, a few key uh, issues. Uh, David Cicilline is uh, about to release a report on uh, antitrust, and that will be uh, hotly debated. As you know, the uh, four major CEOs of big tech were before his committee, uh, and he's going to be offering recommendations about what antitrust policies uh, are necessary. And uh, my view is that uh, we have to uh, have a thoughtful approach. It uh, can't just be a sledgehammer, but there also has uh, to be uh, some accountability, and I'm looking forward to reading that report. Uh, the other issue that is at uh, the core of the, the debate is uh, uh, having some internet privacy uh, standard and legislation. Of course, this debate keeps coming up. Uh, we haven't been able to get it through, uh, but Jan Schakowsky has been leading the effort in the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, and I expect if we have a new administration, uh, that will be uh, front and center. How do we protect people's right to their data? Uh, and what are the privacy uh, norms we need. And then finally, I think uh, access uh, to the innovation economy, uh, rural communities, uh, minority communities that have been left out, uh, how do we provide them with uh, jobs in the new economy? How do we uh, invest in innovation to continue to lead in the 21st century? Uh, those would, I'd say, are the three broad themes. Yeah, and the access to the innovation economy has become really driven home in the last year with everyone learning remotely and working remotely and how much that, that access is important. Thank you so much and thank you for that. Um, I want to turn next to, to Mariana Mazzucato and because your work has 
um, as so much in engaged history and looked back to help us understand looking forward. And I think building on Marguerite's opening remarks about uh, how we got to here, I'd just like to ask you to talk a little bit about what you consider to be the most important kinds of American policy and political activities that have proven critical in promoting constraining or constraining <laughs> technological innovation. What do, you, what, what do you consider to be some of the best examples from the past? Okay, great. So, I mean, as an economist, I always start off with the, um, that we really need to rethink also the theory that is informing policy and then it comes back. So what we actually experience on the ground informs theory. And, and I think one of the really interesting things from the past history of the US when it really was, uh, a leader in innovation. Of course, it still is, but there was also a, a glorious, if you want, a, a set of decades in which you know the U.S. put a man on the moon and back again, and from that spilled over all sorts of different uh, great innovations, including sectors like software. That was a period in which the state didn't just see itself as fixing markets, actually having to wait for markets to fail to come in and fix the market failure. And this is how economists actually speak about the role of the state in policymaking. And so, I mean, the first thing I'd like to say is that I really think that we need to go back to this idea that actually what you require from both the public and the private sector is co-creating and co-shaping markets, as opposed to thinking that one kind of creates value and creates markets and the other one comes in and fixes the problems when they arise. Um, and just to get really specific, and this is my second point, the way that happened historically was actually through really ambitious, what I call mission-oriented uh, entrepreneurial state organizations that were actually distributed across the whole innovation chain. You know, you had very active uh, state funding and the basic research, the applied research, but also downstream around procurement policy, you know, the SBIR scheme, which of course still exists, but also even more downstream ambitious, again, demand side policies like suburbanization. Without suburbanization, we would not have had the full deployment and diffusion, for example, of the mass production, uh, uh, technological and organizational change. Um, and what mission orientation actually means is first of all, focusing on problems, not sectors, not even technologies. You know, the, the internet didn't come out of a period where we were obsessing about the internet. It solved a problem. It solved the problem of satellites needing to communicate. Uh, GPS, same thing, it solved the problem. So mission oriented organizations are focused on problems and the technology follows. And what's interesting with the moonshot, you know, this 50th anniversary that we're actually celebrating of the, of the Apollo program, is that mission, that really bold mission to get a man to the moon and back again, then stimulated, catalyzed cross-sectoral innovation across the whole economy. It wasn't just aeronautics, it was also nutrition, materials, electronics, and again, software emerged as a spillover from that process. So that's another really important attribute. And lastly, what's important there in terms of thinking of this kind of mission-oriented uh, part of you know, US history was the need also to to redesign the tools, the levers that government policy had on the ground. So grants, loans, procurement policy. Procurement, by the way, continues to be a very large chunk of government budgets worldwide. If that can be a funnel for innovation, you just you know, make your innovation budget much larger than just the bits that are siloed in the ministries of industry and innovation. And you know, that bottom-up innovation that actually allowed us to get to the moon, the, you know, many different projects also required lots of failure. So the willingness to take risk. Um, and super lastly, I think a really interesting thing that maybe people don't realize is that there's also conditions attached to the public and private relationships. Even one of the most you know, ambitious private sector uh, laboratories for R&D, Bell Labs, which everyone knows about, that actually came out of a period in US history where there was a real confidence in the public sector. So there was conditions attached, for example, to AT&T's monopoly status. They had to reinvest their profits back into the real economy as opposed to extracting it out. Uh, into innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. And you know, AT&T's answer to that condition of reinvestment to retain their monopoly status was Bell Labs. So getting more symbiotic innovation systems, which is a, cl a clear pr uh, priority for today, we can learn a lot about some historical examples like that one. Those are fantastic. And, and you're right, the symbiotic relationship between public and private is often lost. And I think that's what these histor historical ex examples make so clear, as well as that innovation policy isn't just about the things you put in the innovation bucket. It has to do with things that have to do with economic opportunity and mobility. Um, 
so uh, Anne Marie, I'd like to turn to sort of a, a global a global frame, um, and and think about um, the, how American innovation policy obviously has global impacts, um, and and what do you consider to be the the critical innovation policies for the that have to do with the standing of the U.S. internationally in terms of the competitiveness of the tech industry, um, particularly with expect, respect to China, but also India, Europe, and other parts of the world. Uh, so thanks, Margaret. I was leaning forward because I note right behind you is a book that says The Code. So <laughs> strategically placed for, for this conversation. The, well, the, honestly, the first thing, the, the thing that could do more than anything else uh, for us globally right now is to uh, preserve our democracy and repair it uh, and reclaim it. But that's a separate conversation. So I will stick to, to in innovation. Although there too, I think that the things the United States needs to do are much less about the specifics of regulating our tech companies and incentivizing innovation. Those are critically important. Judy's written a book about them. We did, Mariana and Ro just, just discussed them. But I think it's, it's much broader than that. If, if, if the United States wants to maintain its edge in innovation, it needs to invest in education, it needs an immigration settlement, a workable immigration settlement, needs to invest in equity, and it needs health insurance. And let me explain why universal, real universal health insurance. So I start from the proposition that we have the talent we need, and we attract the talent we need. But the, we, the talent we have, we are not educating nearly adequately uh, for the kind of science and technology and frankly humanities base uh, that you need to really innovate consistently over time. Um, we're educating a relatively small and definitely undiverse segment of our population who are responsible for a techno most of our technological innovation. There's a mass of talent that we need to be educating. And that, that is uh, all the way through early education, K through 12, but actually higher ed too. We, you know, we have some of the best universities anywhere in the world, but higher education overall is not delivering. So education, uh, immigration is obvious. Uh, and if, and, and it, isn't, it isn't just Silicon Valley and, and you know, Im, sort of importing in, India's best engineers, people from China, it's again, much more the ability to have a whole clash of cultures and ways of thinking. Uh, and we've always innovated uh, by, by uh, but with many of our, our immigrants, uh, immigrant citizens uh, leading the way. So that's the second one. The equity piece goes back to our talent. Unless we are using all of our talent, we're not gonna lead globally. Uh, and we have it, but we are so radically unequal. And there are so many Americans that simply don't have the chance uh, to live up to their potential. But the final piece goes to risk taking, which uh, Mariana talked about. The work on risk taking, and there's a lot of it, paradoxically shows that you need at least minimal security to take risks. And it's, if you think about a lot of our innovators, they are people who they know if they fall on their face, they're only going to fall so far. They're not going to lose their house. They're not going to lose the you know, a roof over their heads. Uh, they're not going to end up on the street without health insurance. And people have, have often said, somewhat in jest but not, one of the best things that Obama did for Silicon Valley was extend health insurance extend the ability for kids to be on their parents' health insurance till they were 26, which meant that you have four years after you graduate from college, if you follow the normal course, where you can take risks, you can try a startup, you can follow your dreams because your health insurance doesn't depend on your getting a job. Uh, and a lot of the sociology, again, on if you want people to really take risks, to feel like they can reach for the stars, but risk falling, uh, then you need at the very least to make sure they know that they still have their basic needs provided for. That's such an important part, a point. I appreciate that you bringing that up. You know, I've thought a lot about how the, uh, you know, we the startup hustle is really constructed for people who, you know, have that safety net and 
you know, so many of the original startup hustlers, the pioneers of Silicon Valley, people like Bob Noyce, people like Gordon Moore, you know, they, their safety net was provided by some of the policies you illustrated, right? Education, afford, yeah, they didn't have student debt. They had, um, you know, they had this, uh, we forget that the, there were things that were helping people sort of put them in the position where they could build these extraordinary companies. And that is something that has really degraded over time. Thank you for that. Um, I want to talk, I want to turn to Judy, and Judy, I'd like you to bring us um, into maybe kind of the policy broadly defined, um, which has to do with not just what government does, but also what, what industry does and how they work together. Um, so how do we encourage technology to do good and serve the public good? These are, you know, companies that are out to, you know, they, they have a, they're private sector companies, they have to become profitable, they have these certain metrics they have to meet. Um, and from where you sit, what do you think needs to shift about the way Silicon Valley now does business? What are some myths that are important to dispel? Thank you, Margaret. Um, given the, our dependence on digital technology, I actually think we've reached a point where we need to stop thinking in terms of just encouraging technology in the industry and look at how we change the overall power dynamic at play. And, uh, Mariana talked uh, uh, about this from a, from a different perspective. Many of the specific policy solutions that are being talked about today um, are focused on mitigation of current harms. And these are all really necessary, but they're not sufficient. And like so many of the other challenges we face today, we need to focus more on the root causes. So um, I appreciate your questions, even when there are not clear immediate solutions. And, too often, we're, if, if you bring up a problem and you're not proposing short-term solutions that you can do something about it today, people don't want to have that discussion. And we're uncomfortable with those discussions, but we need to be having them. And how we frame the discussion of these uh, structural issues is really critical. So how technology is wielded today and how we embrace it, and it's both parts, um, is so unbalanced across multiple dimensions. Um, they simply, they, the industry, the platforms, have too much power. And it's why I titled uh, an essay I wrote in 2018, Authoritarian Technology. It is truly authoritarian in nature in terms of that dynamic. And we need to figure out how to achieve a better balance between technology platforms and individuals, between governments and the private sector between large companies and small companies, and at its base between technology and humanity. Um, this is not easy, but until we do this, we will always be looking backward. We're, we're just gonna be trying to, we're gonna be playing catch up. And in addition, uh, for example, in addition to mitigating the devastating impacts of today's platforms on our democracy, on our public health, we need to be thinking about the newer applications also, more broadly about artificial intelligence. What is our life going to be like? What governs our life in virtual worlds? The convergence of digital tech and biotech. Um, there's a saying that I used to love, which is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. But whose values are driving our future? And we really need to be thinking about that as we chase uh, more and more innovation without the balance. And that gets to your second question about Silicon Valley. And I, when I use the term Silicon Valley, I'm not talking about the geography. I'm talking about the tech innovation ecosystem, entrepreneurs, executives, investors. So uh, Margaret, you're not off the hook in Seattle. We are all uh, contributing to this in terms of uh, the, the ecosystem. and. Um, if you look at the culture today, there is a worship of dominance and disruption that is incentivizing problematic behaviors. And I think the best way to understand that quickly is just let's look at three common mantras. Scale fast, fail fast amongst the investment industry creates a winner take all environment and it's not enough to succeed, you must dominate. Great businesses that take longer to grow or may never be home runs often don't get a chance to solve very important problems and, and contribute to the economy. A second one is move fast and break things. Disruption is always good without regard for any consequences. Uh, 
But some things can't be fixed later. Our democracy, lost lives. I think if we see anything right now in this country, in the world, is that um, we could use a little less disruption sometimes, or more careful and considered disruption. Um, and the last is make everything frictionless, from addictive user engagement techniques to sidestepping or ignoring or putting off any regulation that would slow down growth. But the right type and level of friction is absolutely critical to a functioning society. Um, I, I, the, the wonderful innovation ecosystem, again, that Mariana referred to, um, I think of it as having, and that I wrote about in, in my book, I think it, of it as having metastasized and become short-term and self-focused. We do innovation for innovation's sake without enough regard for its impact on the planet or humanity. And last to your question about myths, at the heart of social media today is the notion that platforms are distributing power to the people when in fact the platform companies hold all the power. At scale, the concept of democratization, given the structural inequalities built into the system, there, it's an illusion of giving everyone a voice. And too often, it doesn't actually end up in driving to equality. Um, people t are talking about algorithmic amplification. And what does that really mean? Well, think about a very crowded room. Who gets heard? The loudest voice, the often the angriest voice. And that's what is exact, uh, essentially happening on social media. And another utopian myth is that information flows are self-correcting, that truth will ultimately win. But I think we're seeing how not true that is in, in our environment today. Uh, without a some common context of how to uh, figure, uh, some common context of what is truth, we simply can't function as a society. So I'll stop there. Uh, as you can tell, I could go on forever, but I hope to have provoked some thoughts for our discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Judy. And I think just on the power to the people, that, that actually makes me turn back to our congressman, to Roe, and, and to think about like what are, you know, where citizens um, and, and voters fit, fit into this and, and, and users of technology who are also citizens. What sort of actions can citizens take if they're concerned about this tech environment, but also concerned about what tech policy future tense might do? How can, how can they help, how, how can they have a voice in this process? I appreciate it. I could listen to our three other panelists all, all day and I apologize that I'll have to cut short after this. Actually, the call is with uh, is Senator Wyden on section 230 and, uh, and Judy's comments are, are very instructive in terms of whether uh, we want to look at uh, any curtailment of 230 without uh, uh, w without uh, compromising speech. And one of the uh, issues uh, that, that uh, is up for discussion is the recommending the al uh, amplification uh, uh, function. Uh, the, it, it's one thing for Facebook or Twitter to say, uh, you know, we don't want to take down uh, a post that Roe puts up or we don't want to take down Donald Trump's post. It's another thing for them to affirmatively recommend it in, in news feeds and uh, to amplify uh, a certain problematic speech. And I think that, that uh, we have a lot of work to do to think through how these platforms should be uh, designed uh, in ways that facilitate as opposed to undermine uh, democratic deliberation. Uh, and the, the, I guess the, the, you asked how can citizens be involved? And I think that's the, uh, the challenge right now. I think many people feel that uh, tech uh, on the one hand is providing them with more consumer options, it's allowing them uh, to buy things maybe they never would have had. Uh, it's allowing them to have more information than they would have had, but in other ways is disempowering, disempowering either because of the displacement of jobs, because of their loss of control as parents, uh, because their their loss of control as citizens. And part of the discontent, I think, with tech, part of the uh, manifestation right now in antitrust or privacy is I think a broader theme which is that people want agency over their lives and feel that uh, they don't have agency over the technology revolution 
And so the governing bodies of Congress are the place where we can have some agency. And I think that too often the information disparity, uh, you know, people in Congress, the one thing they don't want to sound is uh, uh, old and out of touch. And uh, tech uses this to their advantage and that uh, people are, they're not uh, hesitant to go after uh, tech, uh, Wall Street CEOs or pharmaceutical companies, but they're hesitant to go after technology. And so I think particularly people who have a technology background need to get involved uh, in saying that we need regulation and citizens need to be demanding that Congress do something thoughtful in, in, in uh, giving them a voice over the technology revolution. So uh, I think Congress has been uh, absent largely uh, in this conversation and, and we can't just have a laissez-faire development of, of technology. Thank you for that. Yeah, that, I mean, one of the things it's striking and kind of across the across the comments is how the, the role of government has, you know, in pulling back kind of a created space for um, for the private sector to move forward. And that also kind of in an untrammeled fashion has not always had the consequences that, that one expected. Um, I want to follow up with a question actually to you, Ro, just because I want to catch you before I know you need sure. to leave very soon, but just a question that came in over the chat, which was the question about antitrust and kind of how the U.S. can develop a balanced and effective approach to antitrust actions, which is what the, the, how the question was framed. Uh, you know, the antitrust obviously is a large spectrum of things. How do you kind of, where you sit, where do you think the, the big, um, the opportunities and, and where are there some misperceptions as well in, in, in that conversation? Well, first of all, I think that antitrust is a very serious issue, but it's not a silver bullet. I mean, just uh, having antitrust enforcement isn't going to solve the democracy problems that Judy spoke about or the uh, healthcare and education problems that uh, Henry Slaughter spoke about or uh, the, the issues of the innovation economy. And it's not gonna figure out how we create jobs in rural communities or in minority communities. That said, uh, I think there are issues in terms of mergers that haven't had enough scrutiny. Uh, there's issues in terms of platforms uh, e e tying their own services uh, to developing dominant market share, uh, issues about uh, uh, wanting uh, platforms to have the portability of data and the interoperability of being able to use other platforms to uh, have uh, competition emerge. So I, I definitely think there's a, a way of having thoughtful antitrust uh, regulation uh, that will preserve economies of scale, that will preserve uh, that won't just break up companies without rationale, uh, but will uh, increase uh, uh, competition and increase uh, the, the possibility for new, uh, new entrants. My only caution on all of this is that uh, somehow I think that people think if we just have antitrust enforcement, we're going to have greater equity in the innovation economy uh, and we're going to have a, a, a better uh, innovation uh, in contributing to democracy. And I think that that's only one part of a much larger conversation we need to be having. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to I'm opening I'm going to open it up to to more conversation and and encourage panelists to to to, to back and forth. But the a question has a couple of questions have come up in the in the Q and A that have to do with China in particular. And so um, Mariana and Anne Marie, I think I'll, I'll kind of put that particularly to you, this question of one, one, one comment noted that is what we're seeing with China, what are the parallels to Japan in the 1980s, which I think is a very interesting way to think about it. But how do you all, um, maybe Mariana, I'll turn to you first, kind of how should we think about, or how should people in the US think about China and how should the world think about China versus US and this, this question of, of a global tech economy and who is the leader in it. Right, I mean, I think the curious thing is I think that China is actually learning the lessons of what worked in the US at the same time that, that the US is unlearning those lessons. <laughs> um, and so if you look at the amount of direct, not indirect uh, public funds, indirect meaning like tax incentives, direct meaning actually putting money towards, uh, again, those big problems that I was talking about before. So the direct funds that China is putting around, for example, climate mitigation in their own country and actually having a clear mission over the next five years to spend 1.7 trillion, that's 12 zeros for those who forgot what a trillion is, <laughs> a trillion uh, 
uh, dollars around greening their entire economy, which means also kind of boring sectors like steel, greening steel, uh, energy friendly technologies, 1.7 trillion towards that, you know, that requires all sorts of different, again, policy levers. It's not just about, you know, introducing, say, a carbon tax. Um, and also, you know, patient long term finance, you know, there's no lack of finance out there, there's often the wrong kind of finance. And I think China has been through its Chinese development bank in the same ways that other countries have used development banks to kind of foster, um, you know, the development of, of new sectors, but also help those firms that are willing to engage with countries around ambitions, ambitious missions, they need, again, that patient long-term finance, because even the Death Valley phase can last like 15 years. Uh, and venture capital, as we all know, especially people like Roe living out in uh, California, venture capital, yes, it's a form of finance for innovation, but it's often exit driven. They want to exit in five years through a buyout or an IPO. And that's not necessarily the kind of finance you need for these big kind of game changing uh, transitions. Anyway, so China definitely has that patient long term finance, which unfortunately in many countries we don't have. Having said that, you know, there's all sorts of other you know, problems that they deal with, which so it, it's not about saying China's perfect, but it's really interesting also to look at whether the you know one of the key lessons i talked about before which is a decentralized network of different types of state institutions distributed across the whole innovation chain if that's going to be also taken on because they do have very large pots of money in particular types of institutions like the one i just mentioned um, and we know that those tend to get a bit inertial um, and bureaucratic and so one of the secrets at least of the u.s model is to have that distributed system you know darpa and um, uh, NSF, NIH, SBIR, I, I could just roll out all the different types of organizations, InQtel, the CIA's uh, public venture capital fund that many people don't know about. Um, you know, so, so I think that's a question. But just, if I can just say something quickly about the topic you were just talking about with um, Ro and with Judy, which is basically about you know, tech for good, but also what is innovation for, that requires very active governance. Currently, we are misgoverning the innovation system. Um, so patents, for example, intellectual property rights, they are too wide, used for strategic reasons. They are too strong, hard to license, and they're way too upstream. So we're actually privatizing the tools for research, as opposed to more the downstream products and, and processes. So that stifles innovation. And that has really hurt the ability, for example, of the health innovation system, which is so important right now with this health pandemic, to really serve the public good. So for example, with the vaccine, one thing is to talk about a race, right? Speed, we need a vaccine, let's race for a vaccine. Another, um, another thing is actually to govern that process in such a way that really fosters a kind of collective intelligence, which the World Health Organization is advocating for, through, for example, tools like pooling the patents underneath the vaccines as opposed to privatizing each little bit of it so, you, so we don't foster that collective intelligence. And this is generally something that the health system has really suffered from, including the fact that we, don't, we still don't price you know, medicines and, and therapies in such a way that even takes into account the huge public contribution that globally goes into health innovation. In the US, the US government spends uh, 40 billion a year on health innovation and the prices of the drugs that come out of that process, of course, with private sector investment too, don't reflect that public contribution. So these are all dysfunctionalities that have to be governed properly, getting to Rose's point that it's not just about regulating, but governing for the public interest. And this, I really think, is a key issue that we should uh, be addressing in the election. <laughs> Yeah, and there's an incredible amount of expertise still within the government that's untapped. I mean, picking on, uh, picking up in a way, analogizing Anne Marie's comment on this untapped talent that's already in the United States. There's, there was incredible infrastructure built up that 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 can be leveraged in addition to improving on what's already there. Anne Marie, I'm interested where you come in on this. So I I, I think you have to start with the question of what are we competing with China for or about? <laughs> because it's just assumed, you know, well, China's got all this stuff and we, so we have to compete. So from the point of view of the big platform companies, they're often saying, their argument is, we, you can't break us up because we need to be this size to compete with Tencent and Alibaba uh, and Baidu. Uh, and because we all need data, because that's the only way we're going to really win the race on artificial intelligence. 
in the first place, I'm not sure that's true. I'm no AI expert, but there are ways of learning that don't require massive amounts of data that where the computer is teaching itself. We it didn't necessarily have to have every chess game in the world to create a chess, a, a computer that could, could win at chess. So it may not be true even on its face, but even if it is, is that, you know, are we willing to not regulate our own industry because Chinese companies will be bigger? I mean, it seems to me that's a question we need to ask, and it's not at all clear to me that simply beating China is the imperative. And then, but then the answer to that is, oh, no, 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 because otherwise China will win the race on a lot of this technology and it will distribute its technology around the world. Well, there, there you come immediately to Mariana's argument, because why is China ahead of us uh, in terms of providing 5G to the rest of the world? The United States doesn't have 5G, and the United States doesn't have 5G because we did not put in the kind of government investment uh, that we needed to. So the Europeans uh, have some 5G systems, but the, the issue about competing with China there to be engaged uh, with the rest of the world is much more about building public infrastructure. The third thing is though, the United States has not articulated a vision of the internet to compete with China. China has the authoritarian internet. Europe has the highly regulated democratic internet. The United States is either the wild west or, or just nothing. I mean, we don't, we have not articulated what I think we need to do, which is to say the virtual world needs to be as rights regarding as the physical world. It needs to be regulated according to the standards of international human rights. Those rights are never perfectly observed, of course not, but they, they are the best guideposts we have and different countries achieve them differently. We need to think about what are individuals' digital rights? And we, uh, New America has done a whole index where you rank companies according to how well they respect individuals' digital rights. But more broadly, you need to think about a, you know, how can you use technology consistent uh, with non-authoritarian uses? So the Chinese internet allows the violation of actual human rights, and obviously with Uyghurs or, or freedom of speech, uh, but it also allows the creation of a completely closed sphere. We should have a vision of the open internet that is secure, that is rights regarding, that, and that's what we compete with when we go to other countries. Last thing I'll say is China can send, sell all sorts of technology or give technology or build systems for lots of countries around the world. But to the extent China then uses all of all of that lending, all of that financing, all of that technology to advance its own geopolitical interests, it will create the same backlash against it that the United States did in many Latin American and African countries after we provided all sorts of infrastructure and corporate lending, uh, but it was really to advance our companies uh, at the expense of natural resources, local populations, et cetera. So even if we go all the way there, it seems to me that competing with China per se isn't, doesn't tell you very much. You wanna ask what is important for us to win and why and how do we regulate the internet consistent with our values as a country. Yet another important lesson to learn from the first Cold War <laughs> about yeah. this one. Um, Judy, yes, t what, please, I'd love to hear your perspective I, I on this. I just wanted to add something which I think is, uh, um, reflects both, because both Anne-Marie and, and Mariana have alluded to this, but something Rose said, which is, and this is true about a lot of policy areas, um, but there is so much uh, complexity and nuance here in both separating out the what is good and what is bad, um, meaning what are the harms and what is good. It's, it's not like uh, some things with pollution, even though I wrote a piece with Sam Gale that was called digital pollution. This is more complicated because separating things out are hard. And then how to implement, how to best implement solutions are complicated because it gets into a knowledge of these technologies and often new technologies. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems I think we have 
is uh, when you think about what can individuals do, individuals can think about their own agency, how do they use technology, although that is often complicated because we don't even have the right education in terms of how to manage your media diet like you have a uh, nutritional diet. But when you talk about what we are asking governments to do, how you encourage governments to act, um, you need organizations, whether it is policy organizations, academic organizations, uh, you need to harness the individual pressures it, to guide what you're pushing for. And it is really hard to find organizations that those organizations need to be independent, not just of technology funding. And again, we have this across all sorts of issues. Where do you go for funding? Who is it that's funding? It's very hard and you put in all sorts of systems into your business to, uh, to guard against it, but it is hard. And, but the second thing is even if you're independent of funding, it is very hard to find technologists that are independent of what I would call the tech utopian mindset, which is we as technologists are trained to think about the good, to focus on all of, and some of the cultural things that I talked about in answering your question are so baked into how we are training new engineers and how people grow up thinking in that ecosystem. So I, I think that as we're thinking about this, we need to think about how do you create either um, uh, augment organizations that exist or create new organizations that really can help provide some of this understanding and guide through the nuance and educate individuals that are not uh, just going to continue to take us down the, the same path. And I am not questioning people's intent. It is, it is the perspective and you need a counter perspective while still understanding the details of the technology. And we don't have enough of that at this point. Yeah, um, Mariana, would you build on that point? I, what are your sure. thoughts? So um, I actually founded a, a, a department in a university here in London, University College London, an institute called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose in order to bring public purpose back to policymaking. And Judy's point about new institutions is really important. So institutions or structures or new instruments that are explicitly about actually bringing, um, you know, directing a system towards the public good. And by the way, the word public good sounds good because the word good is one of the two words. But unfortunately, in economics, it's still just a correction for something <laughs> that the private sector is not doing. So really to reframe the public good as the common good, an objective that we're trying to reach is, is kind of what I was talking about in terms of market shaping towards, you know, if we want inclusive growth, if you want sustainable growth, we're not going to level the playing field to get there. We're actually going to have to tilt the playing field <laughs> to get there. But that doesn't actually mean picking you know, a specific kind of firm technology or sector to support, but actually picking directions and getting institutions and structures in place that actually help build that directionality in the system, I think is really important. And here in Europe, an interesting example of this, besides that kind of mission-oriented uh, work that I was talking about before, which the European Commission on the back of some of our work has made into a legal instrument. So missions are a legal new instrument for innovation policy. An interesting, uh, more kind of local example is what happened in Barcelona in Spain. The, the city mayor, Ada Colau, did something wonderful. She basically said, why is it that you know, citizens are using technology? This technology is often, again, as I mentioned before, at least co-financed by the public sector, if not completely financed in many cases, like the internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, all the examples I talked about in the entrepreneurial state, but the benefits go to the private sector. So she brought in a team of hackers, right, into city government. Um, and there's also a whole kind of research project around this called Decode. And the ambition was to make sure that the data that we as citizens are constantly creating, right, because data, happens, you know, data emerges every time you click on something, that that data that's created benefits citizens in Barcelona. So specifically, for example, benefits the public transport system, 
right? But you could kind of extend that the public health system, the public education system. And you know, this is what didn't happen in Silicon Valley, where just look at the state of public education in Silicon Valley in a place in the world that received massive amounts of public funding. And then citizens end up with public resources that have been basically decimated. We want to reverse that, but it's not going to happen on its own simply by kind of tinkering along. And I just think that example of you know, bringing in hackers into the city government to make sure that we govern the data creation to benefit directly without intermediation, the, you know, the welfare state basically, I think it's just a, a fascinating example. Unfortunately, often city governments, regional governments, national governments and international organizations don't have those digital capabilities. So kind of rethinking if we are gonna have state structures and, and policy that is gonna serve citizens, we actually also need to ask ourselves, do we have the right even curriculum that's being taught <laughs> in the masters in public administrations? Do we have the instruments, the design of those instruments that's gonna get us there? And unfortunately the answer is no. So there's a lot of reinvention inside bureaucracies uh, to make sure that we are able to you know, shift our systems to serve the public. Thank you for that. You know, your point about um, the, the local examples actually relates wonderfully to a question posed by one of the attendees, um, which is, does the new California digital privacy legislation provide a model for the US as a whole, as with air pollution control in Southern California and then the EPA? Is, and the question is, you know, we've been talking about the federal, we talked about the national, but what is the role of state and local governments and where do we have some good examples and productive examples and is what has California done or is not doing that's an example and and where do you see where are there sort of productive places to 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 set an example that that both citizens and lawmakers need to be thinking about and I'll put that open uh, to, to Anne-Marie to uh, to, but to all of you. <laughs> I, I'll give you a couple of examples, but Judy's going to have to speak to the California data privacy law because <laughs> she's, the, uh, she's the Californian here. Uh, uh, but, you know, one example is the city of Chattanooga has the fastest uh, internet in the, in the country. And it has the fastest internet in the country because Mayor Andy Burke uh, worked with municipal broadband uh, to make it happen because he understood exactly as Mariana said, that's a public good. It is good for everyone uh, who needs, needs it for work, for education. It will also attract business. Uh, it, will, it, will, it will lift the economy, but also society. The counterexample, and I don't no longer remember which city it was in North Carolina, but a city that wanted uh, to enact municipal broadband, so lower the, basically treat it just like a utility, like you pay for your water or your electricity. Uh, the, the, the mayor enacted, uh, and the city council enacted the ordinance, and it went all the way up uh, to the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court, which struck it down at the behest, of course, of the uh, telecoms, right, of the, uh, the internet service providers, who were actively fighting the ability to do this publicly at the state level. So there are, there are plenty of other examples uh, where, in fact, you've got government, local government and state government really trying to do the right thing, but they are often caught in a system that at the federal level is hugely skewed in favor of private power, uh, and even at the state level in the North Carolinian example. Judy, do you want to give us some insight yeah, into I, California? Uh, as opposed to going into the actual details, uh, uh, I think they're the actual details of this law. I, I have mixed feelings about some of these privacy laws. I think in the end, it is important for uh, countries and states to begin figuring out ways to protect the data and to put more pressure on the platform. So from that perspective, um, unfortunately, it is the case that sometimes you need states or again, or countries to take a first step to see what works and doesn't work. So I am hesitant to not support uh, uh, attempts in that area. I also have concerns, which is in some ways, sometimes we pass these, these pieces of legislation 
and we think it's enough and that we give a false sense to, of comfort to people, we now have a privacy law, so don't worry about technology anymore. Um, and, and there are all sorts of areas that often we do a piece of legislation that gives, uh, that, that covers one area of a problem and individuals get a false sense of comfort that, okay, that problem is solved. And the data privacy is a, and how data is used is a part of the problem, but it is not the whole problem. And a lot of the issues we have uh, of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, they are enabled in, by the data that's being collected, but we're not getting to the heart of some of those issues. So uh, again, I don't wanna say this is not an important area, and it is, and we need to take those steps, but I have concerns that, um, that it, it could give the technology industry more power by reinforcing the model that we have in play today. And, and that's where I get conflicted. Mariana, your, your thoughts on this? I mean, just coming back to the, uh, the cities and the states in the US, it, I do think it's a period where in a moment of kind of uh, federal impasse, you know, whether it's denying climate change or other problems, which we don't have to go into, cities and states instead are exhibiting quite a bit of innovation, social innovation, organizational <laughs> innovation um, that's quite inspiring in a moment that otherwise is a bit dark. So in California, I'm not an expert at all, and, and Judy, correct me if I'm wrong, there's an interesting debate about um, actually setting up a public wealth fund. You know, we often think of inequality as being um, something that has to be tackled around redistributional policies, right? Taxation, progressive taxation, and that's incredibly important. And unfortunately, we have a lot of regressive taxation out there. But there's also pre-distribution side of things, actually setting up coming back to the previous points, new institutions and structures and a public wealth fund is a really interesting way to think about it because it's a way to get things right from the beginning, right? Not then having to always pick up the mess later by redistributing the taxes because the wealth has been so skewedly uh, distributed. So a public wealth fund would be a direct way to actually capture um, you know, a portion of this collective wealth creation process, which also comes out of taxpayer citizen uh, uh, led investments through the public funds to come back to the state to then reinvest back into the system um, into all sorts of areas, whether it's public education, public health, uh, public um, digitalization. So, you know, code for America kind of programs. Um, and that's also, you know, before when Anne-Marie was talking about the need for everyone to have you know, basic kind of capabilities and opportunities, something that Amartya Sen, of course, talks about. That is, you know, that could be, for example, um, a product of having a universal basic income, at least partly. But I think the narrative of, of a universal basic income, I think it could be strengthened by reframing it through this kind of public fund, public wealth fund kind of thinking. So a citizen's share, a citizen's dividend, which would be distributed through something like a public wealth fund, put citizens not just as getting a handout from you know, the state or you know, the, the rich who give their tax to the state and then the state gives it to them, but they get their fair share of what they actually helped contribute to, what they collectively created. And this is what's often been missing in the US. And the example I often give, just so people kind of get their heads around this, you know, everyone knows about Solyndra, because it, it failed and it became known as like, you know, the US kind of picking winners example of having made a bet on a company that went bankrupt, taxpayer had to come in and bail out that company. That's actually not the problem. The problem is just that often we have citizens having to bail out the failures and not getting their fair share of the successes. So at the same time that the US was funding Solyndra through a guaranteed loan from the Department of Energy, 500 million, another company, that everyone knows about Tesla <laughs> got almost the same amount. And Obama in this strange moment, because he had lots of Goldman Sachs guys uh, that were advising him, but he didn't, I guess, get the right advice. He said, if you don't pay back the loan, he said this to Elon Musk, we get 3 million shares in your company. 
Now, why would a government want 3 million shares in a crappy company that doesn't pay back its loan? <laughs> Instead, what he should have said is, if you do pay back the loan, which of course Tesla did, because it's a great company, they paid it back in 2013 after having taken out uh, the loan in 2009. If you pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares in your company. The price per share went from nine to 90 in that period. Multiply that by 3 million, put that into a public fund <laughs> that would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss and the next round of investment. So this whole issue of kind of innovation policy, I think also needs to be thinking through the risks and the rewards, the ownership, the governance structures I was mentioning before. Some of this isn't just you know, monetary as I was talking about the conditions around patents, et cetera, but also given that the whole UBI discussion is out there, really being quite creative with it and making sure that we're not just you know, uh, socializing the risks, but also the rewards through creative tools like a public fund. And again, this is a discussion in California. Thanks for that. Um, at, speaking of taxes, <laughs> that is a, a question that um, one of our that came in over the wire from one of the from the audience too is the question of tax policy. We've talked quite a bit about um, building programs and regulation and and where tax fits in. That is, you know, part of Silicon Valley's story. You've talked to many of venture capitalists, and they'll say that cuts in the venture in the capital gains tax in the 70s and 80s was important. Where do we, what, how do people feel about this? Mariana, are you are, I, I'm going to, I'm going to punt it back to you immediately because I think well, I'll be quick because I spoke hands. too much. I'll just say three quick things. One, read the history, you know, the, the top marginal taxation rate under Eisenhower, who you mentioned in your uh, opening was over 90%. And that was a period of flourishing <laughs> innovation. So there's no evidence actually that there's such a strong relationship in some ways, either way. Venture capitalists who love to lobby for things like lowering capital gains tax actually are a bit hypocritical because where they actually invest is not where there's low tax, but they're often investing on the back of, again, those kinds of public investments. Without the NIH investments, there would have been no biotech sector. Uh, venture capital always tends to come in 10 to 20 years after <laughs> the state lays the groundwork. And you know, if they were honest, they'd be you know, arguing also to make sure that these same public entities which do lay the groundwork are properly fueled <laughs> and replenished instead of you know, ridding them of the uh, tax base. But also so much ta uh, in innovation policy is misinformed. Reducing tax on business, even through kind of more intelligent uh, taxes like R&D tax credits, there's very little evidence it works unless it's also accompanied by direct investment. So if you're simply making it cheaper to do R&D, you're not going to invest in R&D unless you see an opportunity in that area. And what actually drives the perceptions in the business community of where future opportunities lie, which then creates additionality, a little economics lingo there for making investment happen where it wouldn't have happened otherwise, in business are these kind of direct, you know, again, mission-oriented, you know, frontier investments that create a new area that then businesses are like, wow, that's interesting. I'm going to invest in nanotech and biotech and the internet. But no, you know, there was no policymaker that simply de-risked the investments around the internet economy. There was a very active investment that created the internet economy, which then crowded in uh, companies, which then, you know, flourished in that sector. And if we're just constantly worried about tax, then unfortunately we end up uh, ridding the pots that have to make those direct investments. Having said that, we need smart tax policy and smart tax incentives. And there's interesting lessons there, but I think I've spoken too much. I would just add that at least among Democrats, there is a huge appetite now for companies paying their fair share. This notion that if you are an American company and you have benefited from everything in the United States, the infrastructure, the policies, et cetera, then you cannot escape to a tax haven and pay almost nothing. Uh, so that if you look at the Democratic Party platform, you'll see closing tax loopholes abroad uh, as a big piece. And the other piece, which is, is related, is a beneficial a, a, a policy statutes that require uh, the, the, the transparency and beneficial ownership. In other words, all these, way, the, the way often companies avoid taxes, you have a shell company that owns a shell company that owns a shell company, you can't figure out uh, who is actually ultimately uh, in control. Now, some of that is just to, to cut down on criminal activity. 
Uh, but some of it is also to ensure that it is much easier to track companies and insist that they pay their fair share of tax. And that seems to me just elemental, uh, that it, it, it's simply monstrous that you have CEOs paying less tax than their secretaries. You remember Warren Buffett's point. Of course, we have a president who's paying less probably than, than janitors in the White House. But um, I do think this is a, a big piece of getting back to some Margaret, I just I want to add to um, what both Mariana and uh, Amory said in that I agree wholeheartedly with both of those. Uh, although it could be take both of them, I think it can be taken that tax policy doesn't matter. And I think we're just to reorient that I think that our tax policy has been backward. And the issue is if, if you're asking a question about tax policy means lowering taxes on capital gains or on companies, I think what Mariana was saying was that has proven to say that is not, um, uh, that is not necessarily true. But I'm gonna add the nuance in here again because uh, R&D tax credits, R&D is research and development, but those tax credits are not incentivizing research. They are in incentivizing as much short-term development. Long-term capital gains, a year is not long-term. And so when we're thinking about what we're trying to do to incentivize balanced behaviors across the ecosystem, investment in the infrastructure and the commons and the research, and this gets back to some of the things Mariana said about patents. If you want innovation to flow, it is not just about the development and profit making sectors of the, the, the companies who play a very important role. But when we want to focus on innovation to help the economy thrive, humanity and society to thrive, we've become too narrow in what innovation policy means. And again, I, I am in some ways echoing what we've been saying on this, this panel, but I just wanna reinforce that it is as much how these taxes get in implemented and the message they send. Taxes send messages to what you are trying to incentivize and we've got it backwards. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, Can I just add it, one quick thing. Yeah, please do. Um, we should remember that you know, even though GDP is is limited in how it measures growth, it's actually quite useful for some basic things. And one of the things one can see, uh, if one looks at the um, the income share of the different aspects of GDP, is that the labor share is at a record low, and the capital share, the profit share, is at a record high. And lots of these ill devised, ill-designed, badly designed tax policies have simply increased the profit share. Um, and, you know, really the point of government should not be to increase profits, <laughs> but to increase investment in the economy, investment towards areas that really matter. Um, and there's very little evidence that decreasing taxes has any effect on investment. It does, however, have a huge effect on profits <laughs> and so on inequality. And that's, I think, you know, partly what Judy was, was saying, even though she said it uh, more eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to, first I want to observe that everyone is providing such wonderful, rich commentary. And since I get an eye into all the questions that the audience is putting in, such fantastic questions. And I have the, it is a, a, a wonderful job to try and sift through all of them. I'm not going to get to everyone's questions, but this is such a, a, an engaged audience asking such smart questions. And I want to now turn to something that kind of, I want to, two in succession, I think, relate to one another. Um, one, is, um, uh, one is a question of what does a society, how does a society and the government choose a focused mission uh, like the ones that Mariana mentions. And then a second questioner asks similarly, is the climate crisis the kind of mission that could create profound innovations as it is addressed? So um, I'd like to open it to the three of you to, to your reactions to that. Like what is the next moonshot, the literal, <laughs> literal proverbial? Um, and what, what exactly would it take? 
Anne-Marie, can I I'll, turn you first? I'll uh, jump in. It's, it's, right. a, it's, it's such a great question. I was reading a history, actually, of, of one of the, of Brown Brothers Harriman, a big, a big bank, uh, over the weekend. And it went back to the 19th century and talked about uh, how these dif different families made money in railroads and canals. But what struck me was not the details, but the sense of national purpose of we are going to crisscross the country with railroads. We are going to dig canals. And I live very close to the Delaware Raritan Canal, which was dug by hand in 1830 uh, at 70 miles long. And this sense that we were a nation that thought we can do this, like of course the the actual moonshot in the 60s, and Mariana can talk m much more about that because she's she's written extensively on it. I think there are two really big possibilities right now. One, uh, we may be entering the health age. I heard someone yet, uh, recently on on radio talking about how the space race triggered the science age, uh, COVID, and the all the other health inequities, but also problems uh, that COVID also spotlights in terms of who's dying with comorbidities, with under pre-existing uh, conditions, but also because we do have the ability, and even more if we can really build telehealth uh, into our systems and again, get true universal health care, uh, we could see a, a national mission to radically decrease the health inequities. It is just unconscionable that where you are born determines your life expectancy to, it, it, to a difference of 10 to 15 years within the United States, as opposed to the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, and Haiti or another really, really poor country. So that's one, and the other you touched on, yes. And client, of course, much of what we would do to create a green economy would also help health, for, <laughs> if only to redu re reducing air pollution, but water pollution, so much of, of re retrofitting this country uh, for a renewable age. And I'll just, just one example, I mean, just imagine if as a public works project, every city said, we've got to bury all of our power lines. We know that weather is far more extreme. It is crazy. Of course, in California, they start fires. But in, in New Jersey, you can be out of power for five days because a tree falls on your power line. That doesn't happen in Europe because they're mostly underground. So they're even just little things uh, that would make such a huge difference and provide plenty of work. Uh, and then there are those bigger notions of we can be a 21st century economy uh, in ways that let us leapfrog ahead, precisely in some points, in some situations, because we're now so far behind. Margaret. Thanks. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, um, I, I agree with Anne-Marie that those are two big moonshots. I, I think that we, as uh, technologists, the, the innovation ecosystem, uh, a warning because both of them are things that we can't go after the well we can we shouldn't go after these moonshots by saying we're just going to throw technology at it the same way you don't solve a pandemic with just uh, technology there's a reason why it's public health driving mm -hmm. the pandemic as opposed to just one area of science and as we look at these moonshots and we need to not just have uh, humanity, humanists, human social sciences, but even when you were talking about the social sciences, we're becoming very data driven and siloed. So we really need to be looking at these problems, not just having a tech company hire someone from the humanities. We need tech at the table, but not dominating the table. So it is so critical in these moonshots that we don't solve some of these problems that we've created in the same way we have thought about them and the great einstein quote about you don't uh solve a problem by using the same type of that's not the exact quote but the same type of thinking that got you into it and in both of these cases we have contributed to the problem so let's make sure that as we contribute to the solution we broaden the table uh, and and think about our approach. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Although tech companies should hire more history majors <laughs> and poets. How about having poets. more history majors running those companies? I like the way you're thinking, Judy. Yeah. Um, can can I, I just come in there on the, yeah. Yes, on, please. So this is exactly the kind of work that we've been doing with the European Commission, but also again with cities and um, different countries in Europe, which is to be careful, you know, to both be inspired by the concept of a moonshot and mission, but also to be careful. So the first thing is to do exactly what Judy just uh, did, which is to say, hold on, you know, these are societal and social challenges. Actually, they're much harder <laughs> than purely technological ones. And that's, you know, the concept of wicked problems, you know, is, is, is all about where problems are actually also about behavioral change, political change, regulatory, technological that's harder than just, you know, in some ways getting a man to the moon. And there was a fantastic book by a wonderful colleague of mine or friend of mine, uh, Dick Nelson, called The Moon in the Ghetto, precisely thinking about that. You know, we were able to get a man on the moon and we still had deep inequality on earth. Why is that? Well, guess what? It's much, much harder. And just throwing a lot of money or tech at it isn't going to solve it. And by the way, the kind of moonshots, unfortunately, here in the UK where I'm sitting, around COVID are just getting a lot of money thrown at kind of the technology at the same time that the public health system is actually being in some ways under finance. So your warning, Judy, is, is, is huge for the kind of um, deformation of the concept of moonshot. But what we meant by missions and moonshots in this new work that we're doing in the commission was, you know, you start out with the challenge and the challenges have to actually be agreed on by citizens, right? They can't just come top down. And what's interesting is that the sustainable development goals, or 17 of them, they were actually agreed on widely through lots of consensus building and stakeholder governance across the world. And given that they've actually been signed up to by most countries, and there's 169 targets beneath those 17 goals, that's a very good place to start with the challenge part, right? But transforming a challenge, like the Cold War was the challenge, you know, the, the, the moonshot, getting a man to the moon and back was the mission. Transforming all of these sustainable development goals into concrete missions, um, you know, that requires a lot of, you know, important, well, how do you say, you know, that's a design challenge because if it becomes a really narrow mission that just be, goes into one sector and doesn't galvanize that kind of intersectoral uh, investment and innovation that even the moon landing did, even if it was purely technological, then it's not gonna, you know, it's, it's not gonna get as many solutions to the table, but it's also not going to get us the kind of growth that ideally is not gonna be a trade off. Either we solve the big problems or we have growth. We wanna have growth as a spillover of actually trying to solve these problems. So I just have one example here <laughs> in this report we wrote. I mean, if you start with climate change, you know, which is actually across several of the SDGs, and you say we want, you know, 100 carbon neutral cities <laughs> across a region, that's going to require massive investment in innovation in real estate, construction, environment, energy, food, mobility, the social sector, design, behavioral economics, and then the projects underneath that, and that's where you need to redesign procurement to kind of catalyze that, can be as different as citizen carbon ID cards, clean urban electric mobility, buildings with carbon absorbing components, and so on and so on. So, I think the really interesting thing is take the SDGs, the 17 of them, and make them really bold and inspirational missions, like getting 90% of the plastic out of the ocean, which, by the way, lots of people know about today because of a documentary by Attenborough, so the cultural sector, right? That Blue Planet documentary with that last episode with all these baby dolphins choking on the plastic and dying actually inspired kids and students around that mission. So bringing in the arts, the humanities, you know, theater, cinema, documentaries to the table to galvanize our imagination of what is possible is important. But, you know, a plastic free ocean is a bold mission that's going to require investment innovation across many different sectors. But we need targets to make sure that after one year, after five years, after 10 years, we're closer to the uh, mission. Otherwise, we're in trouble. And that, by the way, is one of the successes of the DARPA kind of organizations. They didn't just turn the tap on on investments. They also knew when to turn it off. So being able to pivot, to be flexible and adaptive is just as important. That's, yeah, um, and that, that turns to sort of, we've talked a lot about what governments can do and shifting the balance of, of power. And I want to, as a sort of last question, we're, we're getting towards the end here, is turn to the, the corporations themselves and to into the private sector and thinking, it's sort of picking up on what you were just saying about the incentives and kind of what's inspiring us and what's driving us. 
Um, there's been a conversation about the future of the corporation and the changing, changing from um, shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Two questions came across the wire that I think are relevant to this. One asks, is changing corporate governance part of improving the innovation ecosystem? And another asks about changing the culture of investors and investment and venture capital and the incentive structure, which um, Judy and, and you all have, have touched on as well as this sort of question of what's driving um, investments and why. Um, Judy, let me turn to you and just, I, I'd like your thoughts on that. What, what is the future of the corporation in this new, this new landscape? So I, I think that having corporations um, be more sensitive to the constituents they have, i.e. the stakeholders, is a, a really important cultural issue in terms of how corporations are governed. And corporations need to be better citizens. Um, but I don't mean citizens as they are people, because I don't believe corporations are people. They are run by people. Um, on the other hand, uh, and you can see I say on the other hand a lot, is the issue about kidding yourself uh, that having corporations focused on stakeholders is going to do the part. Corporations are founded in order to have profits. Profits is what they sustain. So if uh, is how uh, corporations sustain themselves. So if we want to look at corporate governments and how we balance and put in issues around corporate governance to have corporations behave better, we should look at all of those incentives. We should look at what uh, directors and executives are responsible for. But in the end, um, I'm worried that, again, we make that change. We say it's about stakeholders and it's fuzzy, and we haven't solved the problem. Balance is balance and counterbalance. And that notion of doing it co, uh, you're together it. In the end, it is very hard when you run a corporation to think also uh, any person. I, I, I have an opinion. I don't see some of the things that are wrong in that opinion. You're going to listen. And then you're going to say, but you forgot this, but you forgot that. That's what collaboration and balance is about. And if I think the balance to corporations needs to come from accepting a, so a society that corporations don't rule the society, mm -hmm. that they have a very important place in society. And again, this echoes some of the things we've been talking on this panel. So I, I'm not saying we shouldn't be more considerate of stakeholders. And when we were in the corporate world, corporations behaved better, but that's not, uh, that simply isn't enough. And in terms of changing the culture, in terms of the venture capitalists and the investors, I alluded to that in my opening uh, part. Absolutely, people talk about entrepreneurs and executives and companies driving the culture. It's an ecosystem and, and the venture investing behavior is what drives the entrepreneurs. What can get funded? They're, the venture people are sitting on boards. So if we hope to address these problems, we have to think about um, who, who are the venture capitalists? What is the diversity in the venture capital community? How we are incentivizing venture capital behavior? Again, not as individuals, but as an ecosystem. Um, so it's hard, but that is an area of focus that we need. And I feel, I don't feel strongly about it. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> we just have a couple minutes uh, left, but Anne-Marie and, and Mariana, I want to give you an opportunity to chime in on this. Quickly. So I, I would agree with a lot of what Judy said and, and always appreciate her nuance. I will say that Lucian Bebchuk at Harvard Law School uh, took a look at the the corporations at the business roundtable who endorsed stakeholder capitalism, which was a big deal from the business roundtable. Uh, but almost none of those uh, corporations took anything about that statement to their board. And what that tells you if you served on a corporate board is that they weren't planning to change anything really material because you cannot change how you do business materially without taking it to your board. So just, just an illustration of, of being careful about 
where the rhetoric gives you. It's, it's indicative, though, of a social norm shift uh, that is, I think, in many ways, responding to millennial uh, millennials who are the biggest part of the workforce and who are making very clear uh, that they want some purpose with their profits uh, and meaning with their money. So there, I do think we, we, we may see new forms of corporations. California really is pushing the idea of the benefit corporation, uh, the for benefit corporation. So not just a B Corp, not just a label, but that legally the purpose of the corporation would be to create certain benefits as well as to make money. And sitting as a head of a nonprofit organization, I can imagine many more entities that have a for-profit and a non-profit side, uh, where the for-profit side is consistent with the values of the non-profit side, but generates funding for it because the, the current nonprofit sector is just chronically starved from funds from a, just way too few philanthropists. And it's deeply inequitable uh, the way it's set up. So I do think there may be new legal structures. The corporation is just a legal vehicle that we created and has been refined by Delaware and other, other states. We have absolutely the ability to create different entities, legal entities uh, with their different incentives. Mm. I would agree with everything that was said. I would sort of bring it also one step further to say that purpose and stakeholder value, if it's gonna happen, has to be at the center of the system. It cannot just be limited to discussions about corporate governance and absolutely has to go to the board. But even if it goes to the board, if it doesn't change how, for example, public and private work together, then it doesn't have an effect. So purposeful systems. And there, I think it's really interesting to take this COVID moment to test the talk, <laughs> you know, are we actually walking the talk of stakeholder value? And, and unfortunately, the answer is no. And whereas in some countries, like, you know, in both Austria and Denmark, for example, they said, we're not going to allow the recovery funds, massive recovery funds. Globally, there's, you know, trillions being put in as COVID recovery funds. Companies that are using tax havens cannot access them. Great. You know, that's not rocket science. If you're, you know, uh, abating and avoiding your tax bill, sorry, you can't have the benefits of uh, public finance. But also in France, Macron was very clear. He said, we're not here to just save and bail out companies during this uh, very difficult period. We're going to help you transform towards actually meeting the goals we have as society. So both Renault, the car manufacturer in Air France, they were only able to access their recovery funds if they were willing to, uh, you know, decrease their carbon uh, emissions. And so kind of bringing that conditionality to the fore, not as a stick, but as part of the deal, right? You know, the green deal, the green bit's kind of obvious how to do that. The science tells us, but the deal, we need a lot of thinking about that. And, you know, that is about, as we've been saying, changing the structures and the institutions, but also um, making sure that when we talk about profits, Judy's absolutely right, these are for profit companies, but where do those profits actually come from? And given that it is out of this massive collective effort, we need much more kind of you know, negotiation about the conditions through which uh, private companies can even benefit from these massive public investments. And that is about purpose. That is partly the stakeholder value debate. And so, you know, should companies that are spending so much on share buybacks, you know, $4 trillion in the last 10 years has been used just to buy back shares to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. These companies that have been uh, excessively, excessively using share buybacks, should they be able to access, you know, public funds? Um, well, maybe only if you stop doing that and actually reinvest your profits. That's great. We could, this has been such a wonderful conversation and it has been such a pleasure to be part of it. Um, thank you all for, for this. And before we go out, we're gonna go out as every CHM event goes out. There's an ongoing music, museum initiative to ask everyone who appears to provide their one word, which is um, every, every panelist was asked down to write down one word of advice for a young person starting out in their career. So I'd like to ask you each in turn to share your one word and the story behind why you chose it. Um, Judy, can I start with you? You can. So um, my word, if you can see this, is and, um, which is probably not completely surprising given everything I've said here, but um, we're becoming too digitized in our thinking, uh, too polarized. Not everything is a one or a zero. Um, we should not lose sight of the importance of trade-offs, of nuance, of the words and, 
both also. Um, we need to think about both our individuality and our interconnectedness, our ben think about the benefits and the consequences. The give and take of true collaboration. Critical thinking requires valuing both questions and answers. Uh, we can be confident and keep a healthy level of self-doubt. Um, we can be both leaders and followers in relationships that share power. Thank you. Anne-Marie. All right, my word is flaws. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that one of my flaws is that I don't print very well <laughs> and not very evenly on a piece of paper. Uh, <laughs> but th that might seem like an odd word uh, for somebody starting out in a career. But I chose it because the best advice I ever got as a young dean uh, was from John Sexton, who was then the dean of the university of NYU University Law School. And he said, to be a good leader, you have to face your flaws and accept that they're not going to change. And there's two parts of that. One, we all have flaws and you need to know what yours are. Uh, so that part, you, you, just self-knowledge, which is essential. But the second part's even more important. This is like, you can't love cookies and ice cream and decide that tomorrow you won't, because that's not going to happen. You may be able to limit <laughs> your intake, but so you have to accept that you might improve. I'm not saying there's no self-improvement, but fundamentally, if you know that you are a certain way, you need to then hire people who compliment you. If you're a big vision person, you need to hire a detail person. If you are somebody who loves numbers, you need somebody who loves words. Uh, so flaws, know your flaws, assume they won't change and compensate for them with other members of your team. It's fantastic. Mariana, take us out. Right, so I'm Italian, so I've done my word in Italian, sorry. <laughs> so value, valore, <laughs> in, with a pink underlining. <laughs> Remember the pink ladies? Um, so for, I mean, for me, it's just so important that the new generation be part of a new storytelling. Um, you know, it's not just about, you know, we've talked about policy and business and design, but we need new stories. And I fundamentally think that new stories about value, both what is valuable, you know, how do we value things, but how do we come together to value things differently? But also, um, you know, where does value creation happen? So we've been talking a lot about California and there's of course a whole myth that all the value creation happens in garages in Silicon Valley. Well, actually <laughs> it happens in lots of other places, but we need stories and narratives and a new discourse about that. So I would really welcome the new the next generation to, to help disrupt. In this case, we do need the disruption because the old <laughs> stories are bad. <laughs> They're myths. Well, thank you and thank you all. And I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel to close us out for good. Oh my, oh my, uh, what a beautiful program. Um, when I step back and reflect, um, I've had the good pleasure to know most of the panelists reasonably well over the years an incredible set of diverse insights uh, provided right up front, the depth of knowledge and understanding that each brought to the table um, and context on the direction that we might consider based upon historical context. Um, my takeaway really summarized uh, as, as I was noodling out a little bit around, as is often the case, problem definition is the key. Uh, higher level co-creation, uh, markets and regulation, fundamental. It's worked in the past, it'll work in the future. Um, conditions of success um, at times create incredible market power, but that position um, being rechanneled or channeled back into the economy for the greater good of the human condition is key. Um, I oftentimes think about a quote that came from uh, a noted historian named David Kennedy, who's at Stanford, uh, which is that, uh, and this, this panel and the conversation today really reinforces it, and that is that history uh, is interesting because everything has it. And at the same time, it's an imperfect but indispensable guide to the future. Uh, and it's the only mirror and measuring rod that we have for the present. So I'm
thankful for the panelists, the role they played today in helping us shape some thinking about where we are and how we got here and how we might get ourselves out of the place that we're stuck in because there's an immense set of problems in the world. And I think Roe kicked it off very nicely with three frameworks and then each panelist added significant value. So I wanna thank Margaret for moderating and the panelists for their wonderful insights and the time spent preparing and, and, and sharing with us today. So to our audience, thank you. And if you enjoyed the program, I'll encourage you to go to our website and join and give. So thanks again, everyone, and you all have a good and safe day.